So thank you both for your, for your excellent presentations. Um, it, it, again, we have uh, microphones in the room. If there, are, if there are questions, if there's a question, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you and we'll, we'll come to you. Um, as, as people are, are thinking about that and getting ready, I, I, a, a word stood out for me in, in, in both of your presentations, which is around influence. So the, the, the communication effort, the, the, the not being able to direct what happens in a company, but, but wanting to get people on board with a particular message. And then, and then your challenge around, around getting people to see what you could see in the journey that the company was on, clients included, and how you, and again, you can't tell someone to take it on, but how do you get the influence to take hold? So what is there, what is there to say about influence? Uh, in my case, I think I'm lucky because we are a relative small company. So right. I know quite a lot of people on board myself or in the office, in the, in the company myself, and that helps yeah. if you know people and know right. their names. Um, and in communication, you can never do it uh, enough or never do it good enough. And it's uh, always can be done better. And if I look back, I've also not always did it perfectly. I know that. Um, but it's continuing. Keep on going, keep on telling the same story. And sometimes I get bored of my story to the people that I, because I know I'm repeating myself, mm. but apparently it's still needed to repeat. Right. So it never stops. Right. That's, I think, why the, the word journey is a nice one here, because there, this is a journey without a destination. Yeah. So there's no let up in the, in the messaging and the, and the sharing. Gordon, what about influence? Yeah, it's quite, uh, I kind of hinted on it, um, mm. tough job. You know, and I speak quite a lot at conferences or schools and uh, universities. It's interesting because we haven't been on the front foot in this, and sometimes we were too negative. Uh, or too defensive. And when I lay out facts, and something more detail we gave today, you know, we have a decent discussion. It's become too simplistic. So the, influ the influence has been weak at the moment. We need to make it stronger, and that's the element of that. The other point I would say is, uh, of course, we look at it from a European and North American perspective, but you know, the yeah. rest of the world, they, they haven't got the choices we have. Right. And they will carry on, just oil and gas. Um, I just want to make people, or we want to make people understand that uh, there is a balance to be had. Mm. We should not give up this economic prosperity because it's a global issue. And if all sure. we do is export our issues to other parts of the world, it's not helping anyone. Sure, sure. And um, what would you say to the, to, so, so if, I, if I think about, um, if I think about IOGP messaging, IOGP campaigns, I, I know people in client organizations who are the representatives from their companies uh, in those conversations. Uh, and, and we could kind of abdicate to, well, thank God those set of people go there and have those conversations. And I'll wait to hear what I hear back after the next meeting or the next campaign starts. What would you say to the 400 people here about, about how they can fulfill on that request you made to help promote the messaging? Uh, what can each individual do in that regard? Well, the one we've, I hear back a lot of times, and uh, people, they say, look, give me the facts. I want, I want to be able to explain what I do, why it's important, and have a decent debate about it. Right. I have no problem with people of different views, no problems. But sometimes it's not explained in a way that it, people understand there are consequences to certain decisions. Sure. So what I ask people around here is whether it's in your workplace or children or colleagues or whatever, just engage in a discussion around it. You know, we all know what we need to do. We need to handle emissions. Technically, we can. We'll be able to do it, but if all we do is ignore it, push it away, export it to other parts of the world, that's not going to help anyone. So sure. economic prosperity is fundamentally linked. Now, sure. of course, not forever, but it's too good to give away cheaply and easily and quickly. Indeed, indeed. Do we have questions in the room? Ben, get Ben a microphone. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks very much for sharing your story. It was really interesting to hear it um, and very inspiring. And the question I had is, you know, often you see programs coming into organizations. Um, it has a lot of impact, and, and then it kind of tails off. So I'd be interested to hear 
how your company has kept it alive and, and, and kept it fresh for people. Yeah, that's good. We actually uh, kicked off uh, what we call keeping IAF alive exactly for that reason, because after uh, three years, uh, people have, have heard it. Um, on the other hand, we ke you keep on having new people in the company. You keep on having new subcontractors, new clients, new projects, and then you still need to go through it and continue to go it. Um, but it's a indeed a challenge, I think, and that's why we yeah, launched uh, keeping IAF alive. And um, I also must say that uh, after a while, we were able to do this ourselves without external help. We had, the we had our own IAF trainers from within our company. Uh, but this was also the moment we said, well, let's bring in the experts again to see how they can help us here. So we're also not afraid to call in help because it's, yeah, we're also not uh, perfect. Yeah. Are there others? We're not going to run the batteries down in the microphones today, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Very good. Barbara, please. Sorry, Adam, I had, I had one as well. Uh, it's fun. Sorry, Michelle's been far too vocal in the questions here. Um, All right. So, so, so what struck me actually between the two presentations is the strong contrast, maybe between the very personal story, Peter, that you shared and how inspiring that is. And um, I think a, a more if you like, corporate or management side, including also the messaging around CO2, how do we get personally inspiring stories around yeah, the climate change challenge and the role that we play as an industry um, in that? And yeah, uh, yeah, can you think maybe from both of you to say, well, what, yeah, how would that look or feel? Yeah. All right. That's good. Um, mm. And one of the challenges, of course, is exactly how we communicate. So in fact, lessons, we will unashamedly take lessons from other areas. Uh, that's a very good one. How do you relate personally? It's a big part of safety. We've talked about it, it's very powerful. People tell their stories and we've all seen the various ones. Uh, how to do it for climate and the importance of oil and gas. So I haven't got a personal story other than, uh, or one that is so dramatic because we take it for granted. And our children take it for granted. You just plug it in and you get electricity. On the other hand, uh, think ahead, there are other parts of the world who can't take it for granted. They have no option then to, at the moment, burn coal or wood. And perhaps something around that I think would be very useful. So thank you for that. Uh, maybe to, to add there is um, uh, um, in Holland we have a special week once a year where at primary schools it's called the, the, the week of te technical education or um, to, to get young people interested in, in uh, engineering basically. And um, um, I, I, I participate, I give presentations or it's I, I interact with the kids at school about it. And the first thing I do is ask them um, um, do they, if they do know where the power is coming from because they plug in their iPads, they plug in their uh, PlayStations and the like. And that's already, and that these kids are 11, 12 years old and they no, do not all know that you, what you need to, to, to fabricate, manufacture all the things that they have these days. So that's uh, adding the awareness at least that is not so simple. Thanks, Fons. Barbara. One more. Yep. Uh, it's, it's on the environment tour as well. I was afraid Fons would uh, steal my question. Uh, to help all of us in the advocacy, uh, Gordon, on, on uh, our industry, oil and gas, and the, and the future it, it still has to play, would, would it help if we could also demonstrate that our industry is looking at improving its environmental footprint and how we're doing it in parallel to the fact that it's required in the mix and all that good, the, the good storyline. I think proving that we do care as well as an industry about the environment and how we are tackling that, I think would help in the debate. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, because, of course, one of the things, and th this is one of the things that came up, was that, and it's perhaps related to this point, that you know, if you look at uh, a lot of the information that's pushed out, it is about that, those facts. They're not particularly done in a personal way. They're done as factual, and you, know, you, you kind of have to look at them quite closely to work out that it's actually an oil and gas company that's 
advertising or talking about it. Mm. So the facts are there, but it's a bit like we are, I get the thing we're a bit too defensive. You know, we start on it like this. So the facts have to be, we have the information, we have to do it in a different way. So whether it's, as you say, the environmental success or what we do, just as we talk about safety stats where, you know, it's the safest place to work. I mean, who would have thought that a few years ago? It's the same with the personal story. So that's exactly the kind of thing we're trying to craft in this communications message is to, is to think of ways that people can use and connect to that are different from uh, what has been done in the last few years because it's not to any lack of um, a story being put out there, but it's not connecting. Right. Yes, sir. I must say, this side of the audience is performing magnificently where <laughs> questions are concerned. <laughs> Magnificent order. Yes, so sir. So, so thanks for your story about uh, Seaway. John Mossman from Mayor's Forum. Um, you talked about a, a two-year survey that you conduct, and you're getting <coughs> good, good results from the survey based on the, the training that you've done. Through incident investigations, are you finding any areas where your training isn't effective and where somehow maybe there are conflicting messages still coming through the organization and looking back at an incident, you think, there, we've got to do something different or, you know, either around incident-free training or deeper technical training. So are there areas where you still see weaknesses? Mm, yeah, if I look back on... Um on the incidents that we, we have had. Um, as an example, we, um, uh, we, the statistics are very good, but uh, last year, for instance, still four medical treatment cases. And all those four uh, were uh, for an object in eye. And we call that a medical treatment case, by the way, because somebody on board has to see the doctor that we employ and is on board. Others might call it first aid, but we call it medical treatment. So yes, of course, when you have one of those, it can be an isolated case, but we've had four of those last year. And we provided them with the you know, all safety glasses that are out there in the world. Uh, we have, I can show you pictures of the stores. We have thousands of glasses on board because everybody can pick. They're all, of course, approved, but whatever they need. And still, um, we have those four cases that somebody had something in their eye while wearing glasses. And um, so then we go deeper into that, but we have not found where we investigated that that it had anything to do with uh, IIF. Um, at least we couldn't, we couldn't find it. I, if I could say it's more training, we could have done that, but it's not about training. Um, unfortunately, we have not been able to, to find out why it actually happened, except for the fact that it all happened in South America where the wind was always blowing. That was the only common thing we could uh, find out in those four cases. So maybe it was a wind and a venturi effect. So the glasses that we normally have on the North Sea are okay. But if you go to another area where the wind is blowing differently or whatever, um, it's not good enough. But it did not uh, give us any more insight in IAF uh, because I don't have to tell anybody anymore to wear safety glasses, for instance. Yeah, we, but we do there, we actually, um, um, we, we, it, it's we, and that's, we borrow this from Exxon, it's mining the diamond, uh, you, 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 wherever you, uh, you can have uh, not holding handrails and things like that, but that's, uh, you don't want anybody to get hurt because of that, but you also search for, um, uh, is there a diamond somewhere that could be really disaster, even though the likelihood is very small, the consequences are very high, basically, that's the thought behind that. Um, and um, so yes, we, we do that. We, whenever we have uh, an incident, we categorize it according to certain axes. And we've had um, uh, incidents that we categorized as, oh, this the likelihood is very small, but the potential could be very high. Um, and that had did not, um, if, I if I think back, did not have a relationship to IAF. In the case that I recall, it had to do more with equipment actually. So yes, we, we do that, and it's very important to do that, because statistics, that's why I say I don't show them, because they are there and they show 
really, really good, but there's more behind it. There was more behind it, yeah. Okay. So, because you've all been really well behaved, you get another break, and it's about now. Please join me in thanking these gentlemen for their presentations and this conversation. Thank you.